Chapter 28 They stepped off of the path into the glow and Drew knew, beyond a doubt, that they were close to Penny. The place was outdoors and it was night, hilly and rocky. Drew, Drew thought it was familiar because she could feel Penny there. He seemed to be everywhere, in all the rocks, the ground, the sky. I know this place. Does it seem familiar to you? Her father asked, looking around, holding his umbrella at the ready. Drew glanced around. Yes, it does, she agreed. Where are we? It's the gorge near Margincourt, he said, and when he said it, Drew recognized it too. We're home, she asked. No, use your power. Are there any people nearby? Drew checked, looking. No, she reached out further. Still no. Further and further. Father, I can't find anybody here, anywhere. No humans, not even Inklings, nobody. Check Margin Corps, he said, and she looked up to where the place must be and saw there, outlined by the dim moonlight atop the mountain. He's there, Drew said. She could feel him inside the place, could see a bright spot with her special vision that represented where he was. He's in your bedroom. I see, he said. But where is everybody? Where are the Inklings, the dragons? This world is very old. I suspect they're all dead. So this isn't home, Drew said. It's probably one of those alternate worlds we were discussing before. What should we do, Drew asked. He certainly knows we're here already, so I think it's too late for stealth. Drew heard a noise, a scratching sound, the first noise she'd heard since they stepped into this world that they didn't come cause themselves. She made a quick adjustment to her power. Father, there's power everywhere here. The glow that drew them here was everywhere, dimly woven with everything, and as she watched it grew brighter, then still brighter. I suspect we've triggered a trap, her father said, shifting his grip on the umbrella and glancing around. What kind of trap, Drew asked. Keep your eyes open, he said, and Drew could hear more scratching noises and some groaning and scrambling. She heard rocks rolling down hillsides. Then she saw the first one. It was just off the trail they'd been following, a few feet ahead. A hand shoved up through the ground, joined by another. Then a body sat up, dirt falling from a grinning face and empty eyes. They're animated corpses, her father shouted, as more of them started emerging from the ground. The power Drew had noticed was animating them, awakening them, and Drew could see that same power working everywhere. She reached out as far as she could and could find no end to it. There must be millions of them, she said, gesturing once to bat the one she'd seen away as it approached them. It flew off the path and into the side of a hill, but got up again, shambling towards them. He's been robbing the graves of hundreds of worlds for these things, he said, waving his umbrella, using his power as a bat the same way Drew had, knocking the dead things away. There are too many of them, Drew said. She still had not been able to find the end of them, searching with her power. She gestured at a group of them and clenched her fist, cutting them off from the power that animated them and they collapsed onto the ground. When she opened her fist again, though, they climbed back to their feet. They won't stay down. No, I expect not. She could feel him reaching out as well when they both slapped the things away before they got too close. There are too many for us to destroy them all, he said. What do we do, go home, Drew asked, turning and holding a palm outwards towards one of the things that had been climbing down a hill and it leapt towards them. Her power caught it in midair and it hung there, struggling to get at them as Drew gestured and flung it away. No, we may never have another chance. We must go forward. He shifted his grip on the umbrella and opened it. Take my hand, he said, and Drew took the hand he offered, feeling his power working. Her feet left the ground and she could feel a breeze gathering under the umbrella. Under normal circumstances, she knew, it wouldn't be nearly strong enough to lift even one of them. With the help of his power, though, they were lighter than air. 
Mary Poppins, Drew, Drew said, looking down at the ground and the living dead things that covered it grew further away. Who? he asked as he steered them toward Margin Corps. Drew didn't bother to answer. She was busy using her power to explore this world a little further. Those things are everywhere, she said, above the wind in her ears, as far as I can reach. I know, he said. What do we do when we get there? I'm afraid we'll just have to improvise, he said. The receding ground was crawling with the living dead. Even the road had disappeared under their growing numbers. Drew could sense them in the hills, among the rocks, and in the caves as well. The only place that seemed to be entirely free of them was Margin Corps. Hold on, her father shouted as they moved faster towards the castle, and she could tell he was getting tired from having to keep both of them in the air, especially climbing as they were. They reached Margin Corps and lifted over the wall and glided down into the courtyard, landing gently. Drew couldn't sense any of the walking corpses inside the walls. All she could sense was Penny. He's still in my rooms, her father said, closing the umbrella and adjusting his hat. Let's go. You're sure he knows we're here, Drew asked as they made their way up the stairs. Almost certainly, her father replied. It's what I would have done. Coming here is exactly what he expected us to do. There were no torches, no lights anywhere, so he conjured up a glowing ball that floated a few feet above them as they climbed the stairs. It worked better than a torch, but it was a bit draining, Drew knew. She could tell there was no one else in the building but Penny. She could still sense him, still in her father's rooms, not moving. She could also tell there were no more of those animated corpses in the building anywhere. Maybe we need to go home, to our Margin Corps, Drew said. We may never get another chance like this, even if it is a trap. We can't miss our opportunity. They reached the landing to the level where his and Drew's rooms were and paused at the closed doorway. He still hasn't moved, Drew said. I know. He pushed the door open and the glowing globe floated up the corridor. There was no furniture anywhere that Drew had found. Every surface seemed to be thick with dust. Every corner had a nest of cobwebs. The place had been empty for a long time. The entire world had been empty, she thought, for a long time. Maybe even thousands of years. Why did he come here? Drew asked in a whisper. No one is using this place. It's been dead a long time. They reached the door and stood there. Drew took a slow, deep breath. Ready? her father asked her. As I'll ever be, Drew said. His power flared with a flick of his fingers, and the door exploded inward like it had been kicked with a steel-toed boot of an angry giant. The sudden abrupt noise, Drew thought, shattered the nearly eternal silence, and that was made even louder because it was so quiet before. There was a yellow light in the room, and Drew's father let the glow he'd been fostering die because of it. Unlike the other rooms, this one had the furniture that Drew was familiar with. They stepped over the threshold, Drew letting him go first. Penny, her father shouted, I'm sorry, but this is necessary. Penny didn't respond, and as her father stopped standing in the middle of the room and Drew knew something was wrong. She stepped around him to see what he was seeing. There, at his desk, was a body, obviously dead. There was a big, greenish-yellow jewel there, protruding from the corpse's open mouth. The jewel was the source of the glow. What is it? Drew asked. Another one of those things like those outside? No, this one is not animated, her father said. Take a look. He sounded disappointed. She went over reluctantly to look at the body. The body was that of a man. He didn't smell, and she knew that was because he'd been dead a while, but maybe not as long as the animated corpses from outside. There was something familiar about that face distorted in death and by, and by the big jewel that had shoved in his mouth. Is that, she started to ask, but her father interrupted her. If you're going to ask if that's Penny her father said. 
The answer is yes. Drew stared at the corpse for a long while, trying to convince herself her father was wrong, but she couldn't deny it. It was definitely Penny's face. What's going on here, she asked. That's why we can sense him, because he actually is here. That's what drew us in. The jewels what amplifies his presence, making it seem like he's alive. Who would have killed him, Drew asked. I think he killed himself. And I think, while this is Penny, this isn't the Penny we're looking for. You mean, this is one of the Pennies from the Ultimate Worlds? Yes. But why do this? Why lure us here? I don't know. He walked over to the door at the back of the room, the one that was the entrance to the Walker Worlds. He opened it, stepping back and frowning. As I suspected, he said, nothing. The space behind the door was just an empty closet, and Drew could sense nothing at all coming from it. We'll have to make another one, she said. Yes. He closed the door, stepping back and closing his eyes, extending a hand towards it, and she could feel his power working. He stopped, lowering his hand, opening the door. It was still just an empty closet. It didn't work, Drew said. Yes, he said, closing the door. He repeated the process, his power surging a bit more than before, and when he opened the door, it was still a closet. I think we've discovered why he's invested so much of his power here. We can't escape, Drew said. Oh, I'm sure we can. He escaped, after all. There is a way out. We just have to find it. Do things work differently here than they do back home, Drew asked. I don't know. I doubt it, but this is such a new experience, I wasn't even aware that it was possible to travel between these realities until recently. But he's got us blocked here. I didn't know he could do that, Drew said. It's possible, but it requires an enormous amount of power. Still, he couldn't have thought of everything. He'd have to know that, though, Father. He wouldn't have made it completely impossible for us to escape. Perhaps he's only hoping to delay us for a time. The light from the jewel began pulsing faster and faster till it grew very bright and then flashed. Drew could sense a wave of power radiating from it. Then the glow died completely. What did it do, Drew asked as the room plunged into darkness. I suspect it's the second part of the trap he's laid for us. The glowing orb of light he'd used to navigate the dark hallways flared back to life, and Drew felt him reaching out with his power. She did the same, expanding her awareness outside the room, outside the walls, past the hundreds of thousands of agitated, animated corpses gathering around the base of the mountain. Father, Drew said, it seems like there's a lot less of the world than there was earlier. Yes, it's disappearing rapidly. Drew could feel it fading away, the forces that held the world together, releasing matter itself, crumbling to particles finer than dust, finer even than individual molecules. What happens when it gets here, Drew asked. I think it'll render us down to our basic elements like it's doing everywhere else. That's how he'll stop us from escaping. He's going to kill us before we figure it out. He's going to kill me too, Drew asked. I thought I was the only one who was safe from him. He's insane, Drew. If he's going to become some sort of god to recreate the universe according to his own desires, he's probably convinced he could recreate you too. This means I'm no longer safe from him either, Drew said. Exactly. What do we do, Drew asked. I don't know. He glanced around the room and she could feel his power working as he examined everything in it. She could feel the end of the world coming closer now, still far away but growing faster. Beyond the place where the world fell apart, she could feel nothing at all, like the universe itself no longer existed there. Penny had rigged this entire reality to self-destruct when his trap had been sprung. 
Drew wondered if he hadn't somehow created this place to be used for this purpose. We need to think of something really fast, Drew said. He glanced at her, the light from the glowing orb making the shadows on his face sharper. There is one thing we can do, he said. What? Ask somebody. Ask who? There's nobody here but us, Drew said. Imhotep. We should still be able to summon him. How? We don't have any potions. She felt a brief surge from his power. I suspect there's a vial in your bag, he said, nodding at it. She reached inside and her fingers closed around cool glass. She took out the blue vial, sealed with a cork, and knew that it was the potion to summon Imhotep. We don't have a sacrifice, she said. We can't use Penny's body. Imhotep, Imhotep won't take a corpse, and there's nobody else but us. Exactly. He was smiling as he said it, but Drew stepped away, recoiling at horror in what he was implying. No. No, Father, I won't. If you don't, then we'll both die. I'm not going to sacrifice you to Imhotep, Father. He may not even be able to help us. If that's the case, then you will die a few minutes after I do. Father, I'm not ready to take over from you. I'm too young. I still have a lot of training to go through. You should use me as the sacrifice. I was not much older than you when I became the sorcerer, Drew. As for your training, that is never complete, nor should it be. You should always be learning. You are more ready than you realize. You are enormously powerful, more powerful than I ever was, more powerful than my mother, who was my predecessor. You have talent. You are adaptable. Mars and Corps will yield up its secrets to you as well. You learn and apply what you've learned. Humanity will be in good hands. Father, I can't, Drew said, feeling tears starting to flow down her cheeks. I'm the past. You're the future. You must. We do not have much more time. Do it now or you won't have time to do whatever Imhotep says you must do to escape this place. Drew fumbled with the cork, finally pulling it out. The familiar herbal scent of the potion was strong, strong enough to make her eyes water even more. She jerked her arm across her body, the potion spraying from the bottle and over his clothes. She spoke the champ to summon him, her voice trembling with her tears. Imhotep, your knowledge we seek, the secrets only you can tell. Imhotep, we offer this soul, your price in a human shell. The clouds appeared overhead, seeming to expand beyond the boundaries of the room, and the wind started with lightning flickering. A lightning bolt lashed down, flickering around her father, bathing him in its light. Her father burst into flames as Imhotep seized him, and Drew took a step back. His face cloaked in fire regarded her, the mouth moving as he spoke, the voice distorted, but still recognizable as her father's. Ah, child, you gave me a mighty sacrifice, Imhotep said. How do I get home, she asked. When you reflect, you will discover that if you can see it, you can go to it, Imhotep said. Where do I find Penny, she asked. Not sure how much time she'd have, how many questions she'd get. You know where he must go to do what he wants to do. It lies at the end of the path. She sighed. How do I destroy him, she asked. When next you see him, he will lie. His lie will reveal the answer. You may not see it, but someone who knows it how will tell, though it will cost him his life. She took a deep breath trying to think what she should ask next. As a reward for giving me this fine meal, I will grant you an answer to a question that you do not know you should ask. The answer is this. Yes, but you must be patient. What? She started to say, but the fire grew brighter and then disappeared. Her father's body stood there a moment longer before collapsing into ashes. She didn't have time to stand there to cry over him. She could feel the world growing even smaller, the end approaching even faster, 
And if she didn't hurry, she knew his death would have been for nothing. She thought about what he told her about how to escape. Reflect, she said, glancing around the room. The mirror, the one that revealed the nature of the viewer, stood there in its usual place against the wall, covered with a curtain. She walked over to it, pulling the curtain away from it and looking at her reflection. Like the rest of the furniture in the room, she felt no power radiating from it. It was just a big old mirror. She summoned a glowing orb like the one her father had been using and looked at herself. She didn't make the glow as bright as he had and it flickered like a fire. Looking in the mirror, she could almost imagine that she was actually back in her own margin core in her father's rooms, not dusty and dead like this place. She thought about what Penny had said, that they create their own worlds, and almost without realizing it, she put her power to use. The background in the mirror shifted until it became the same as her father's rooms. She reached towards her reflection, touching the cool glass with her fingertips. She felt dizzy for a second, like the room had suddenly shifted around, and she staggered slightly. She reached out with her power and noted that she no longer felt the encroaching end of the world. She felt the familiar corridors, the comforting presence of Lala and the other Inklings, the horses in the stables. She was home. Hello, this is J. Franklin Evans. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stories That Suck. Did it suck? Let me know. Be sure to like and subscribe.